So, good afternoon, good morning, welcome wherever you are. You're joining me here in York, and today we're going to do a tour of what is known as the Minster Precinct. Um, York, of course, is famous for um, its fabulous Gothic medieval masterpiece, York Minster, um, and we're going to have a good long, lovely look at that. But also, there's a kind of land around it that forms what they call the Minster Precinct, which is a collection of fabulous buildings. So I wanted to take an exploration around the, the precinct, and I can take this in. And I thought we'd start today somewhere we've not been before, which is outside the house uh, of 60 Walk. And the reason we're starting here is there's a gentleman that lived at this very address that could have very easily prevented today's tour taking place. I'm talking about a man who decided that his ambition or purpose in life was to burn down York Minster. His name was Jonathan Martin, and he'd been born in Hexham, in, in the northeast of England, uh, at the latter end of the 18th century, into a poor family, but very much God-fearing. And um, everything had gone to a fairly sort of normal for him as a child, kind of close-knit family. But uh, when his parents died, um, when I think he was aged about 14, things deteriorated. He started having visions which he believed were coming directly from God and they were always set in flames. He saw the fire of redemption to be a quite literal uh, sort of symbol for his faith. So not surprisingly, when he moved here to York, he moved next to the Methodist Chapel, which is just here, the First Methodist Chapel. But as let's just sort of talk through. So in 1804, Jonathan Martin decided to leave the northeast to London for the streets paved of gold to make his fortune. But unfortunately, upon arrival, he was press ganged by the Royal Navy. And for the next six years, he was in effect made a prisoner on naval ships. He tried to escape a number of times. In one of them, he was hit on the head with a truncheon. And it's been suggested that this did significant damage to his brain and may have impacted later on behaviours. And by the time he finally got out of uh, the Navy, he managed to settle down, find a partner, have a child, but he became increasingly obsessed with the Church of England and what he saw as their wicked, lax, immoral ways. He'd become a, 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 a Methodist in, the, in what they called the Ranters, a kind of very sort of fairly sort of angry, sort of, uh, you know, edge of the, 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 the Methodist, very, very critical of the Church. And he acquired a gun and decided he was going to shoot a bishop. So, of course, once the authorities found out about this, he was captured in prison and sent to an asylum, where he spent a number of years in West Auckland, from the place where uh, Mary Ann Cotton, those that know that story, where she lived. Um, so he was, in, he was imprisoned in the asylum. He eventually escaped from the asylum. And it seemed that nobody worried too much about this, because actually he was at large for a number of years before he kind of pops back up. And uh, he appears and he writes a book about his life, the life and visions, I think it's called, of Jonathan Martin. And he sold this book for a shilling and bizarrely sold 14,000 copies. So actually he's kind of had, had enough money. And so when he moved to York in 1828, he was a man of means. He arrived at the latter end of 1828. And he decided that the, the visions had come back so frequently by then that what he needed to do was destroy God's house in flames. Because every vision he had was God coming to him, showing him the flames, showing him the way. So on the evening... I believe the 1st of February, 1829, he stayed behind at the end of a service in the Minster. He had with him flammable liquid, um, a paraffin, and uh, he got hold of rags and bits and pieces of vestments that he kind of stuffed in his pockets and created, if you like, um, the torches, which he lit and then swiftly left. Now, nobody actually noticed until the following morning, this fire was raging. The night watchman obviously hadn't spotted it. And so the fire was very, very advanced by this stage. Huge amounts of the Minster had been destroyed. They did their very best to protect what was left, but huge sections of it had been destroyed, including all the kind of precise, precise documents and vestments dating back to the 14th century. It was a huge and immense loss. But eventually they managed to bring the fire under control. And of course he then set about trying to establish who it was had set the fire. And that wasn't very difficult because Jonathan Martin had actually written three letters to the Minister authorities 
complaining about their behaviours. And on one of them he'd put his address, 60 Old Walk. And so the police were dispatched, the constable were dispatched to 60 Old Walk to arrest Jonathan Martin because he'd fled back up to his native northeast. And it wasn't long before he was captured, but his mother's proclamation that he should die by hanging didn't come to pass. He was tried and found guilty, but he was decided he was criminally insane. He was taken off to London's famous Bethlehem Hospital, Bedlam, where he died around about 10 years later. But if Jonathan Martin had his way, the minster that we see in front of us now simply wouldn't be here. This tour wouldn't exist. So, uh, you know, I think we can say that uh, Jonathan Martin sadly did his worst, did his best. No sound, John. Is that what you're getting? Yes, John. No sound, John. Let's keep moving. And uh, perhaps that'll, uh, that'll pick up. So I'm getting a better signal reading now, so hopefully that will uh, just catch up. Just move around here. Oh. Fuck's sake. Mm -hmm. A lot of buffering. That is a just come round the corner. Can you let me know if it's coming back now? If we're getting into a better place. The buffering is very low. Do let me know if you can see or hear me. I think I'm going to stop. Are we up? Has it settled down now? Ah, we're better now. Okay, are we back in? Are we back in the room? Can you just confirm that you can, uh, you can see and hear me now? A buffering emoji. Okay, we're in. Fantastic. Okay, so don't know what happened there. I'm gonna, I'll try and go back down to, uh, to get 2,000. We're just getting very poor signal down there, but just let's just try one more time. If not, we'll, we'll give up. But I did want to just talk for a minute about the bed and area. Um, so I'm not quite sure what happened there, but let's... Uh, Let's see if we can sort of achieve a happy medium around about here. So I think we, we think, I want a buffering emoji. Yeah, me too. Good, I'm glad. Fine, 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 good. I'm glad, thank you for that, Rosemary. So I don't know where we got to with the story of kind of Jonathan Martin. Had, 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 what was happening when you last heard me? <laughs> well, I had to pull this down and edit and re-edit and, and load it back up with a, with a new story, Jonathan Martin, if we can't do that. So, better than my Chromebook. Anyway, I'm getting a very good signal down here. It's telling me that the signal is good. So, uh, fantastic. So, let's talk about the Bedden then. So, we are in the Minster Precinct area right now. The, the Minster, quite literally, is about 100 yards away on our left-hand side. Um, and the Bedden, which we're looking at Bedden Hall right now, 
is um, the chapel, the, the, sorry, this is Bedden Hall, and uh, I've had Bedden Desk up, interesting. Um, and the Bedden, this area here, is the former precinct to the Vicar's Choral of York Minster from the 13th century onwards. And the word Bedden is derived from early English, bead meaning prayer, or bed meaning prayer, and en meaning house, so house of prayer. And today very few of the original buildings remain, um, but the surviving Bedden Hall here and the chapel we'll see in a minute, obviously surrounded by 20th century um, development. So the Vicar's Choral were the priests who kind of maintained the daily pattern of prayer and worship in medieval cathedrals. And they usually began as deputies, even servants of the senior canons um, who comprised the cathedral's chapter. Now the canons of York um, were, it, it, to, to be a canon meant you, you would have a lot of income from land rents and so forth. So these were handed out to kind of very significant and very well connected members of the clergy because they could expect to have a very, very good life off the back of the income. But they didn't want to be bothered with the kind of day-to-day -day kind of trivialities of going to, to, to the minister and saying these prayers of devotion, uh, what they were kind of paid to do. So they appointed the vicar's choral to be there in their place. So they were kind of deputies. And um, they were the first in England to be formed with their own college um, here in Bedden uh, in 1252, sort of very, very close to the minster. And they sang the cathedral's 10 daily offices. So there's 10 song masses a day and drew most of their income from requests to sing masses for the affluent dead, which was the chantry income. So they often started as choir boys, um, and they received their music instruction from the presenter of the minister, the man in charge of music and singing. And they'd be expected to know around about 5,000 ecclesiastical chants. Now, new college members were forgiven to go out, even for a haircut, um, until they'd served in this area for six months. And at the height of their prosperity in the 1380s, the vicars have established a hierarchy for their own management and possessed expensive assets. This is their chapel, by the way, we're seeing now coming into the picture. Yes, it's recorded, yeah. So the Bedden vicars formed a strong community. They dined together once a day, and they dined in Bedden Hall. This was usually at kind of five, and they had social links with the monks of St. Leonard's. And archaeological evidence suggests they lived well with a kind of high-status diet, including venison, and possessed some prestigious glassware, um, but there was always a suggestion of kind of transgressions, even impropriety from the Vicar's Choral. Things that they shouldn't have had, dice, which were expressly forbidden, have been found. Items of jewellery and traces of silk and luxury items. And written records witnessed some striking moments of kind of indiscipline over the years, including brawling, riotous drinking, carrying swords and promiscuity. Though having a regular mistress who had been treated with kind of some kind of lunacy. So York's vicar's choral endured as a diminished body for far longer than they thrived. St William's College was founded in 1461, we're going to look at that in a minute, and that kind of brought competition for chantry income. But the Reformation had a greater impact, in effect, once they got rid of prayers for the, the intercessions, that really was the end of the vicar's choral. That happened until 1547 under Edward VI. So that was kind of the end of their, their ability. They hung around for quite some time, but the huge difference of course, by this stage, was that vicars could marry. So they moved out of the college, set up with their wives and families, so they needed to communally dine. So the need for communal dining hall sort of fell by the wayside, and gradually, one by one, they deserted the place. And so by the second half of the 16th century, in effect, this was all but over. And it became, from that point onwards, just kind of urban. It became a slum for many years. Um, so that's the kind of bed in, the place of prayer and bed and chapel is now the home of the Glazer Studio, the people that do much of the, the work to restore the medieval stained glass, of which York, of course, is a huge repository. But going back to our story about the lax behaviour of Vickers Coral, it was put into particular challenge because this area where we are here, at the gates of the Minster Precinct, about to enter the precinct, was an area that was notorious for vice, with so many religious pilgrims coming to York, so much wealth on display. Inevitably, temptation was also available. And whatever your vice was, whether it was something of the flesh, gambling, drinking, it was available here. Of course, the problem was that the Vicar's Choral tended to get themselves involved in these temptations. 
they couldn't sort of rise above them, as you might say, and they found themselves falling to temptation. And they're conspicuous by their absence in the church. And of course, people are paid for these prayers to be said. So it's very notable the vicar's choral were absent, the choir stalls. So they came up with a fantastic solution. And if I just spin the camera around to this side, you see above the blue door here, you'll see something of an outcrop. If we look up. And what is sticking out there is what remains of a bridge. And it's a bridge that was built to link from this side of the road to the precinct to the college on this side of the Vicar's Choral to enable these rather degenerate clergymen to pass from one to the other without walking the streets and getting enmeshed into the sin and squalor of the street scene. So I think scandals in the church is anything new. I'm afraid to disabuse you of that. So this is the best preserved gates of the Minter Precinct. So by passing through, actually entering into an area that would have been controlled, the gates would have been there. And of course, in one hand, obviously, to protect the Minster is full of priceless ecclesiastical gold, silver, artworks, and of course, good old-fashioned hard cash, as well as relics, artifacts, and so forth. So the, um, the protection system was needed and effectively would have surrounded this area. So we are now in the precinct itself. I mentioned a moment ago St. Williams College. That is the building here on our left, right hand side, sorry, over the middle of your picture. And St. Williams College was endowed and set up as a, as a home for chantry priests in the 1460s. The grant was bestowed by none other than the Duke of, of Gloucester, who went on to become uh, King Richard III, had many relationships with York. So that was founded in 1461, and the idea was to try and recruit a sort of better calibre, if you like, of, of cleric to come and serve in the chantries of York Minster. But it was short-lived. Within 70 years of it being built, of course the Reformation had come, and bans had been put on the prayers and intercessions for the dead. So its lifetime as a chantry college was fairly short. Dedicated, of course, to St William. St William was the patron saint of York. He was a kinsman of uh, the Norman kings, close to King Stephen, related to, we think, to William the Conqueror. He was an Archbishop of York, and it's said that he became a saint when, on his return to York after a controversial appointment, as the Archbishop, he was, a, he was greeted by many thousands of people. It said on Ouse Bridge, which promptly collapsed. And so all these people fell into the river. And of course they believed these people would drown. But actually what happened was nobody did. And so it's put down as a miracle. His second miracle was when then in the first fire of the Minster, the Minster was almost totally destroyed. The old Minster that, that replaced the one that's here now, or the one before that rather, and uh, when they found him, his coffin was barely scorched. They opened his coffin, his body was as if it had been buried yesterday, it was giving off a sweet, perfumey smell. So they declared him to be a saint. So that's St William. Just looking closely over this, because the Minster Precinct is a fabulous area, but it's also actually been restored enormously, not least by a chap called Frank Green, who we're going to talk about in a minute. And uh, when he came to have these doors replaced, he looked to a fantastic craftsman in this area from Kilburn in North Yorkshire, a chap called Thompson. He only known as Mousy Thompson. And famously, Mousy Thompson, who worked in a lot of churches, carved little mice into his work. Now, suddenly somebody's tried to take this one, has nicked it. Over here, a lower flush of profile, they've not been able to. So thankfully, we can admire Mousy Thompson's work up close. But it's a good reminder that when we look at a door like this and you think immediately, wow, look at that original door, it's nothing of the sort. You know, a door with 14th, 15th century timbers simply wouldn't survive. So, so much of the precinct is about how you, if you like, manage the upkeep. I'll pull you along here to see the stone of this building. You can see now here, very, very pronounced decay. Look at this for erosion. You can sort of see here, I don't want to touch it or flake any away. But the, the magnesium limestone needs serious attention in this area. So by comparison to the Minster, which is in very good shape and has been maintained, this building is a significant need of investment. 
it hasn't sadly hasn't really had a purpose for many years it used to be a fabulous restaurant i'm sure rev dot on here will know maybe susan as well beautiful stunning courtyard on the inside um that unfortunately we can't access it was of course um a fantastic residence for the clergy beautiful place but it really really needs to uh, to have some injection of capital into it for its upkeep and i'm sure that's part of the minister's plans going forward because obviously it's far too important for us to lose so turning round, we get what i think is one of the finest views not only of the mint one of the finest views anywhere in england we're looking at the great east window the largest expanse of medieval stained glass anywhere in the world put in between 1405 and 1408 at enormous cost the money largely coming from these prayers for the dead this chantry income this belief that on your death you're much more likely to go to purgatory than heaven or hell but while you're in this place of purification awaiting hopefully a sentence to, 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 to heaven then others could pray on your behalf they could intercede prayers could be said for your soul and so chances are the richer you were the more sins you had to atone for you remember it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven well they meant it the church really held the rich over a barrel and so the response of world two citizens was to set up chantries people employed to pray for their souls and the souls of their families after they departed to ensure them a place within heaven so consequently it wasn't unusual for money to be left behind and wills probate is a great source of this and we know that for quite a few of the very significant aristocrats it wasn't uncommon to leave money for 20 30 even 50,000 masses to be said for their departed souls so you can imagine that's very very substantial chunks of cash being passed from the wealthy to the church authorities in order to save the souls and of course this was absolutely frowned upon by the protestants it was certainly one of the key elements that luther objected to but it was responsible for a huge supply of cash into the church and that cash was spent here so when we look at this high watermark of medieval architecture absolute triumph of engineering vision and a kind of artistic excellence it's made available because the sheer liquidity of the church at this time and the belief that the best way to secure your place in heaven was to provide cash to the church to what degree that that's fundamentally changed i don't know i'm not going to comment i wouldn't want to uh, set any hairs running on that one i suspect the relationship has changed somewhat now i don't think many people would believe that's the best way to get to heaven but they may well feel it's the best way that they can use the resources they've got that's people's free choice and of course as well we're tithe at this period so people were pretty much compelled to donate 10 percent of their income anyway and that's right the way down to kind of uh, farm peasants village villains you know people working the land so that wasn't just for the rich everybody was expected to contribute to the church so uh, this is what they used it for so um we might say they could have spent it on other things that this was a sort of monuments to themselves but my goodness me what a legacy it leaves behind and so when we look at the mint we're looking at the largest gothic cathedral north of the alps it is an absolute beast we're going to walk all the way around it but i want to pick up another couple of few buildings of the precinct before we do so and the east window by the way we're looking at here which is an absolute triumph depicts in the top sort of uh, sort of the gothic arch there you've got sort of god in his heaven so that all the archangels and so forth and in the lower two-thirds are scenes um from from the bible particularly from revelation so the end of the world all the kind of nasty scary with the seas boiling and kind of you know the uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse and all that sort of really scary stuff to remind you no doubt to to cough up um on time so the first and completed part of the minster we're looking at here the chapped house which dates from 1290 it's almost entirely separate from the minster it has a small sort of corridor if you like that connects it so if you look for above at the minster you'll see it's not symmetrical because of the chapped house so the chapped house was the meeting place for the canons so talked earlier about the canons they were the people appointed to oversee the ecclesiastical affairs of um, the, the episcopal see okay and for the minister as well so they met here if you go inside to this day um, there are sort of chairs in you know, sort of booth chairs if you like whatever you call them 
all around their perimeter so they meet in the round. And what is particularly interesting from an uh, architectural point of view is that when the, uh, the roof was built, it was the first time anybody anywhere had worked out how to build a self-supporting roof. In other words, there wasn't a column supporting it. So this was very typical that amongst the architects, the engineers employed in the building of the major cathedrals of Europe, there was something of an arms race amongst the senior clergy to build bigger, higher, grander, because in doing so, of course, it attracted people and it attracted patrons. And so helping us to build the biggest window, the highest tower, these pull on our, you know, our human centers, don't they? We still like to see things, the biggest, the smallest, the longest, the widest, the oldest, right? So that kind of human nature hasn't changed. And so there was always a kind of clamor to get behind, get involved with projects that, uh, that would build these huge, fantastical, edifice. We'll come back to that in a minute, but of course that meant raising cash. And the guy who lived in this house was the guy who was responsible for that cash. This was the treasurer's house. Now, when William the Conqueror first took the city, became the monarch, obviously, in the, the latter half of the 11th century, one of the first things he did was investigate the finances of the then Norman Cathedral. He'd appointed Bishop Odo, I believe, as the, as the Archbishop. Um, and uh, to his dismay, he was told that the coffers were, were largely empty. And so he appointed the first treasurer. So the treasurer, of course, was the, uh, the person who was responsible for raising the cash, tapping up the wealthy for their contributions to ensure there were sufficient funds to run uh, the, the, the minster and everything with it. And that isn't today's minster. So we'll come to that in a minute. We're talking about the minster that stood on this spot through the Norman era, what we call a Romanesque um, minster. It's a cathedral. But nonetheless, the treasurer's house was here. So this version, built on the same spot, dates uh, from the, uh, I think it's the early part of the 17th century. So it really is rather more modern. And um, what we know is that obviously this is a house that has been built in a very kind of luxurious style but that also um, it was a really important house in the development of York's history because it was purchased in the latter part of the 19th century by a chap called Frank Green. And Frank is lovely about it when Wisteria's out at this time of the year. Um, not the time of year, obviously, but April, is it April, May, Wisteria? Beautiful. Anyway, that's all Wisteria. So Frank Green bought this as a residence. And it was going to really important move because whilst York had very fortunately sort of survived the kind of demolition destruction that happened elsewhere because of the Industrial Revolution, nonetheless, it was in a very poor state. Most of these buildings were in, were in a state of very, very poor repair. And so when Frank Green took on this building, decided he was going to refurbish it and make it suitable for contemporary living with all the comforts one would expect in kind of Victorian high society, hot running water, anyway, heating, etc., um, gas, all these things. <clears throat> he transformed this property and he kind of set in stall a fashion then for taking on board these buildings which were simply glorious but had been fallen into such a poor state of repair. And so Frank Green inspired fellow um, entrepreneurs and, and, and philanthropists to use their private wealth to, uh, to restore. But look at the view from his front door, it's not hard to re realise why he would choose this area. It really is absolutely sublime. And so Frank Green, very, very important figure um, in York, he eventually donated this house to the National Trust, it's now a National Trust property. We're we'll back here. Of course, on Halloween, tell a very famous story associated, but isn't it absolutely magnificent? We have statues either side. And of course, as we're here, let us revisit a couple of the ghosts that are here, depicting, we believe, Frank Green and uh, his lady, lady friend, could be romantic, we don't know. Could be friend, could be sister, who knows who it is. But uh, it's well worth another look as we're here 
it'd be rude not to, wouldn't it? There we have. Frank Green would have been to Peter. So I say, Frank Green, really kind of important figure because he is really driving along this narrative that if we want to keep York special, we want to restore it and maintain this Palladian paradise, this Arcadia, then we're going to have to dig deep. Because if we leave it to its own devices, it's going to fall to pieces. And so these buildings are a tribute to the belief of Frank Green and others that realised that if you want to keep something, you've got to cherish it, you've got to look after it, and you've got to nourish it. And so that's what he was all about. And so that is a testament to him. So we're going to move from the eastern side. We're going to walk now along the northern side of the Minster, through the Minster Gardens, which is a, a lovely place to be, lovely and quiet today. I don't know how, what the wind is kind of doing. I'll, actually, over here, we'll show you one thing before we do do so. And um, we were talking earlier about erosion and damage. And uh, you can see here, if I just stick my camera through the railings, and hopefully don't drop it, that... Uh, there we have a carving of St Peter, who until comparatively recently was up on the east window, moved in 2013, and you should see how degraded it is. What you can see, hopefully, is he's got two hands, one on the right hand side of the picture is holding a church, because St Peter traditionally was seen as the, 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 the founder of the church, the western church at least, St Mark on the eastern side. His other hand is a pair of keys, but you can barely discern his other hand, I don't think you can really sort of see it. Um, but of course he had the keys to the church. And the reason that he's here, the reason he was on the Minster, obviously is you know, St Peter, who's very significant, but he's also the saint to whom the Minster is dedicated. It is the cathedral of St Peter at York. Not as the Minster, colloquially, Minster meaning meeting place of pilgrims, but it is St Peter's Cathedral. That's its official name, which is even longer. Metropolitical Cathedral of St Peter at York. But nobody uses that term. It is solely the, uh, the Minster that is the name that's used. Now, I talked earlier and said, we'll come back to the main minister in just a moment, and we'll talk a bit about its building. But one of the very sort of few fragments that can kind of left over from the old minister is the Archbishop's uh, Palace. So the Archbishop of York has lived in Bishopthorpe Village since the, uh, the beginning of the 15th century. But previously, he lived here. And the building you're about to see was the palace where he lived. So he lived within the minister precinct. And he had his own chapel and palace. And so we'll see these two kind of fragments that are over here. So again, fully restored. What remains of the palace become the Minster Library over the years. So again, it's a modern kind of functioning building. But it's a very, very old part, one of the oldest surviving parts of the, the original Minster precinct. We know that Richard III and one or two others, luminaries, well-known people here throughout its history. I'll just bring you over a plaque just to show you. So there we go. Within the Archbishop's Palace here, King Richard III invested his son as Prince of Wales on the 8th of September 1483. So there you go. Richard III lovers, we were connection to his place there. The other part of, of that remains here, the Archbishop's Chapel over here, forms what I believe is a very, very dignified war memorial. And uh, regulars will know I often take to the memorials. So we'll take the opportunity to do so as we're here. Um, really kind of rather different here. It's a memorial to the Second Armoured Division, which was raised during the Napoleonic Wars in the early part of the 19th century and went on to serve with distinction in every major conflict that's happened ever since. It is most distinguished for its relationship to one of Britain's most famous battles, the rearguard action at Kohima in 1944. So this memorial here is the National Kohima Memorial. And uh, for those that don't know briefly, Kohima was the turning point in the War of the Pacific. Up until that point, the Japanese had successfully uh, kind of won every element. They kind of taken island by island going across the Pacific. From Kohima onwards, that began to be reversed. But it was on enormous odds, hugely outnumbered, and it was the Gurkhas that saved, served with extreme distinction at Kohima. And uh, there are Gurkhas based here in York, still to this day. So this is a memorial for them. So I think it's very dignified and beautiful. Um, so let's move back to the Minster. So I've mentioned this isn't the original Minster, but it's been here an awfully long time. So the Minster we're gonna have a look at over here now was built starting about 1220 
Archbishop de Grey began the process of replacing the room in Eskminster and was completed in 1475 when it was finally consecrated. It was never finished, as you might say. They'd simply run out of money to spend on it. At the height of the War of the Roses, Edward IV was uh, simply a bit fed up with it going on and ordered it to be opened and consecrated to it. opened 1475. It's notable in not being completed that uh, when we come in a moment you'll see the central tower that uh, whilst it is 200 feet in height looking magnificent in the autumn sunshine it's missing a very conspicuous element if i spin you across to the twin west towers you'll see the filials poking over like fingers reaching up to the heavens are of course absent on the central tower they should have been there the reason they weren't was simply time run out the money was being spent elsewhere and so consequently just open the thing up we'll worry about it later and it never happened because from this point onwards if you like the high period of investment into cathedral building had come to a close and of course by the time of the reformation the catholics um, were replaced by the protestants the taste and appetite for large-scale church building had very much diminished so consequently whilst york is the largest gothic cathedral north of the alps it could have been a good deal larger it could have become the largest in europe but as it is because of this penny pinching by edward the fourth in the 1470s seville actually has the record for being the largest cathedral anywhere in europe the med medieval cathedral sorry so that's the sort of stakes we're talking about it indicates of course york's importance that york should have the second largest cathedral medieval cathedral in europe says a lot because of course that means bigger than Notre Dame in Paris where I believe Flo is going to be taking you uh, a bit later on today um, and of course they suffer a fire as well and actually people uh, experts from York Minster went over to help and assist Notre Dame because there was a second fire or a, fir a later fire here in 1984 that destroyed the south transit roof so uh, there was recent knowledge if you like of how to kind of bounce back from these disastrous fires and so a team from York went over across to France to help with the planning for Notre Dame so uh, hopefully that was valuable to the sunshine the autumnal sunshine now glancing onto the to the stone looks absolutely beautiful the minster is built of white magnesium limestone it's a stone that is used extensively in York first used by the Romans to build their fortress and used everywhere ever since so the city walls York's castle its churches the minster all made from the same stone look at that contrast now isn't that absolutely beautiful let's get that angle there to get that and what really captures you here for those that haven't been or, or haven't sort of stood next to it is the sheer size and of course that's deliberate it's to make you feel small insignificant it is quite literally a kind of exercise almost in stagecraft through architecture let me just take a sip of water I'm a bit dry insofar as that you are a mere speck in God's big plans and the church, of course, is the extent of God on earth. So you are meant to feel insignificant. But you're also meant to feel that in passing through these doors, you are experiencing life in God's mansions, fulfilling the promise. If you follow the rules set out, we look at the, the carvings in these are contemporary carvings, but done to mirror the original medieval. We have scenes depicting from Genesis that ultimately really is about rules, isn't it? It's contrasting the behaviour and morality, of course, of Eve, who uh, kind of blows it for women everywhere, and does so, thank you, to Noah, who of course follows Christ, and of course Abraham, who gets ready to prepare to sacrifice his son Isaac before God he said provides a ram for him to kill so we've got Abraham Noah on the one side we've got Eve on the other so it doesn't take a genius to work out the point that's been kind of made there which is about if you're going to attain salvation you need to learn to follow the rules you need to do what you're told and of course imagery stories parables incredibly important in pre-literate Europe and of course everything was in Latin so pictures in windows sculptures 
engravings in and around the Minster precinct were a daily reminder of what he should be doing. And he also would have had very familiar figures here. See, in these vestibules that, was a, that we now see are empty, what you would have found originally would have been depictions of saints. And in the medieval era, saints were kind of like superheroes, they're like your Marvel figures. Insofar as they had special powers to fight demons and dark forces, everyone had favourite saints. Um, and the old idea is that demons and the devil were around to kind of mess with you, and saints were there to be on your side. So saints, people called upon the saints very frequently, particularly on their feast days, to, uh, to come to their aid and And of course you have various patron saints associated with certain things. Christopher, of course, famously, the travellers and the sick and so forth. Um, so saints were very much um, part of the day-to-day -day worship. But you can see that missing here. And the reason for this is that under Edward VI, the surviving son of Henry VIII, who came to the throne age nine and was under control of a cabal of kind of very, very um, militant Protestant uh, clergymen. Iconography was banned. The worship of saints was banned. And they were told to strip away the imagery of the saints on the minster. So this is why to this day we see the empty vestibules, okay? But also, more fascinating, I think I've probably shown you this before, and the sun's shining nicely, you should see it well, is if we look up into this sort of vestibule here, you should see a pair of legs. Which suggests to me that this was pulled down with a rope, very roughly, very quickly. I thought we'll come back and finish that at some point. And the set of lost things, I don't know. Um, I'm sure somebody will know this painting set of lost things. Um, so there is these little legs sticking out, which is a which also shows that the speed. Um, who is the saint? St. Anthony, is it really? I learned about a funny saint the other day. Saint Fiacre, have you heard of him? An early Irish saint. Lots of Irish in the early church. And uh, he's most commonly known. Saint Fiacre. For Saint Fiacre's curse. Which I'm not going to be so. Um, I'm not going to mention it, the condition. But it's very uncomfortable to sit down if you have suffered this particular condition. And apparently, Saint Fiacre was a, a martyr, as you might say, to this particular. Uh, thing that, might, that made it very, very comfortable to sit down. Um, but apparently the treatments in the medieval era that became known as St. Fiacre's curse was they believed that St. Fiacre was so holy that uh, the evil was trying to escape from out of him. And it was coming out the only way it could from the back. And so they decided it should be burned in hell. And so the treatment was developed to use a red hot poker to burn these things off. And again, I'm not going to get too graphic, but you have to say, oh my goodness, thank goodness for the Jewish doctors that in the 12th century realized you could take a bath and add certain lotions and potions to help deal with that condition. I think you'd agree, it is pretty hardcore to be burning the blighters off. But uh, there we go, St. Fiacre, St. Fiacre's curse. So there's, there's a new saint for you for the day to think about. So I don't know if Rev. Dot is aware of St. Fiacre, but she can, she can look in. Uh, <laughs> and find out what it was that he was famous for. So we're coming round and we are on the uh, the south side now of the Minster. We are sort of following the sort of four sides. We've, we've seen the east window, the northern side, the western elevation, and we're now on the kind of southern side of the Minster. Again, get the central tower, beautiful contrast up in the, uh, the blue sky. So the central tower stands 200 feet above ground. And very deliberate being 200 feet. And the reason was that it was a, the, 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 the church tower of St. Mary's Abbey was 150 feet. So consequently, it's outdoing it. It's saying, we're better, we're bigger. You know, you just don't count. And so that was really one of the main drivers for rebuilding the Minster, starting in 1220. Was it simply wasn't big enough, it wasn't grand enough. Since the Romanesque, the Norman Cathedral had been built, there had been a succession of huge cathedrals being built, particularly in France, Notre Dame, Chart, and so forth, and it wasn't big enough. It wasn't grand enough. It didn't have the status anymore. So this ambitious building program that took over 250 years was basically one-upmanship. It was keeping up with the Joneses, as you might say. This was an exercise in demonstrating that because York was such an important Episcopal see, 
it should have a cathedral to match. And so all this money, expense, time, effort, creativity and endeavour wasn't just in the service of God and faith, but rather in having the biggest one. This was all about kind of minds bigger than yours, which is kind of great, you know, that's human nature, we love all that. Um, but it did mean, of course, that people spent their entire working lives working on this building and would never see it completed. Generation after generation of stonemasons, woodworkers, glassmakers, general workers, working in, of course, very, very dangerous conditions indeed. Health and safety was non-existent. Many, many people died in falls, being crushed by stones and other forms of accidents. So there's a huge human cost of building of this scale. But we can't fault the human ambition. It is simply beyond I think, our ken, really, to imagine you could build on this scale without power tools, without lifting gear, with very, very basic tools and equipment. And yet they're not held back by this. They're inspired almost, really, if you like, by the limitations to create this wonderful masterpiece of Victorian Gothic, not Victorian, medieval Gothic architecture. And actually, we think it's actually the third church to stand on this site. So I mentioned, obviously, we've got the contemporary ministry, you can see it on this side. We've got all the repair work being scheduled, going through. But also, before the Norman Cathedral, we've got the original church. And the original church takes it all the way back to the year 627. So under this chap, Constantine, this country had become part of the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, transferred across to Christianity, or rather, made its allegiance to Christianity. And so it was part of Christendom. Now, when the Romans up to left York and England and Britain in the early part of the fifth century, they took Christianity with them. And the next settlers of these islands came with their own beliefs, what we now call paganism, but actually, that's nice, we've got the scaffolding out. Um, but was, was actually, um, you know, just a, a, a sort of Celtic traditional form of, of worship. She would call it that way. And so they weren't Christian. But there was always a desire in Rome to see these British Isles come back within the folds of Christendom. And so in the very early years of the 7th century, around about 601 AD, Pope Gregory in Rome decided that he was going to send missionaries to reconvert the people of these islands to Christianity. St. Augustine was sent to London, and then the monks, the Irish monks from Iona, were sent here to York. And why did they choose York when they were looking for a place to send the monks? Well, there's a very good reason for that, and that under Roman occupation, once they realised that conquering the entirety of these islands was basically a non-starter, the Scots, or the Picts, whatever you want to call them, were simply too difficult to defeat. The landscape was too demanding. And the prize, not really worth it in terms of assets. The Romans had come here as asset strippers. They wanted lead, tin, gold, stuff you could dig out of the ground, turn it into cash. Very little like that in Scotland um, at that time. And so, basically, they built Hadrian's Wall and said, that's the end of the world. They didn't get any further north. So York is the furthest north the Romans ever got. So this settlement became the last of the Roman world in Northern Europe, Northwestern Europe, whatever you want to call it. And uh, they split it into two. Britannia Superior, all from London, Londinium. Britannia Inferior, I'm from Ibarakum, or York. So it was a capital city. So when Pope Gregory got out his maps of Britain in the early part of the seventh century, these maps are already 200 years out of date. The reality was that York, no doubt, had fallen very much a long way behind where it had been during the high point of the, the Roman occupation. But nonetheless, he used this as the basis, and the monks were sent here to York to make this, if you like, the wellspring for the Christian fellowship. That's why they were here. And they finally struck pay dirt in the year of 627, because in that year, King Edwin of Northumbria, the king these parts was marrying the daughter of the king of Kent. The Kentish royal family were Christian, so there was no question whatsoever that she would marry a pagan. 
So as part of this marriage deal that was used to cement a life in the people of Kent and the people of the north, Northumbria, was that the king needed to convert to Christianity on Easter Day in the year of 627. Paul Linus, a great teacher, founder of St Peter's School, about half a mile down the road from here, um, he did the conversion of the king and the marriage ceremony in a small stone church that had been built on the site. That happened on Easter Day in 627. So even by my ruby maths, I can work out that four years from now, we're going to have a 1,400 year anniversary of the founding of a Christian church on this very spot. We don't know precisely where in the estates this first church was. Archaeological evidence hasn't been found to say where precisely it was, but we know it's somewhere upon this site. Is James Taylor, as a, I've got a friend, or you'll be, whatever that song's called, being played. So 1,400 years, but of course, the history of this area goes back even further. The area of the precinct was the location, the Roman fortress, this capital city, was right here beneath our feet. And the basilica, the central administrative and military building, was located precisely on the spot where the minster is right now. So if you go down into the basement, the undercroft of the minster, you can see the footprint of the Roman city. Via Pretoria running down currently where Stonegate is, Via Principia running alongside us now. So the two main routes to the Roman fortress are still used to this day as Stonegate and Petergate. And uh, when we look over on this side, we've got the Roman column. The column's been brought up from below ground. Because if you're going to Undercroft again, we can see the base of these um, pillars. This one had been collapsed. It's been brought up above ground in 1971 and installed on the location of the corner point of the basilica, the fortress, the central building. So there'd be a row of columns in both directions supporting the building. But of course, it's a great deal higher than it originally would have been because the Roman layer in York's got to 20 feet below where we're supposed to be. We need to look down under the ground to find actually the traces of the Roman occupation, the period of Roman domination of the city. But this is the marker. So when we're looking, we're walking around the Minster Precinct site, we're thinking about this being a place of importance from a civic point of view, a religious point of view, a military point of view, a royal point of view. For 2,000 years almost, this spot has been deemed to be the centre of the affairs. And the last thing I'm going to point out up here on the Minster, before we kind of back, walk back around see the last bit of the precinct, is the famous rose window. One of the most loved of all the glass windows in the church, and one that was very nearly lost in the fire of 1984. They deliberately collapsed the roof and timbers to protect the rose window. And the rose window is quite simple, really, in a depiction, insofar as it is a circle of roses, white and red roses, because it symbolises the union of the House of York and Lancaster after several decades of war in what's become known as the War of the Roses. Basically, a family struggle between the descendants of Edward III for control of the throne between the House of York and Lancaster. And it came to a decisive end in 1485 at the Battle of Bosworth, when Richard III was killed. And that was bad news for York because he had been a patron of the city. There was a record in the city that they, the Corporation of York administered a note of grief about the loss of the, their Lord King, which didn't get on at all well with the new Tudors. But nonetheless, Elizabeth of York, Edward IV's daughter, married the new King Henry VII. And we know that she had this remarkable life, Elizabeth of York, because we'll try, we'll try Linda, to get inside one day. Um, when she was born, her father was king. She was the daughter of King Edward IV. When he died, he was briefly succeeded by her brother, Edward V, but he became one of the princes of the tower 
when their, father, when their uncle, Richard III took over. So she'd been the daughter of the king, she became the sister of the king, she was now the niece of the king. But then after the death of Richard III, she then married the king, she became the queen. She was the mother of Henry VIII. She was the grandmother of Edward VI, of Mary I and Elizabeth I. So quite a dynasty for Elizabeth of York. And this window, dating back to 1500, commemorates that union, the white rose and the red rose coming together. So the last part of the tour, we should go back and take us back around. So we're looking at the Mincer Refectory area, um, which is recently, which is rather a lovely building. For a long, long time, it was the Mincer Choir School, but uh, during COVID, such a cash kind of crisis, it brought to a head some financial problems that have been long running and challenging for the Mincer School. And so it no longer operates as such. Of course, the choir is still there, but the, the, the actual uh, prep school is gone. So it's now been opened up into a restaurant, which is very lovely, and we hope it does, does well. Um, it's a fabulous building, a worthy addition to um, the precinct. And great now that after a long, long time of it being closed up, it's found a use. I think it's a great location. And uh, I certainly will be trying it. I haven't done this yet, but I will try and uh, no doubt be able to do a recommendation. So this is the Minster Gardens, very small, modest part of the, uh, the precinct. But I think you'll agree it really is a fabulous place, a fabulous collection of buildings. It really is uh, an absolute treasure house and everywhere you look we can find sites of architectural interest, artistic beauty and uh, just inspiring. Of course we could live without the scaffolding that'd be nice but of course it's a natural part of what needs to happen. We know that you can't have a building like the Minster without the upkeep, without the work on it. What's nice is that in recent years, last sort of decade or so, somebody had the great idea to put the stone yards working outside in plain view. And so if you come down here during the day, the weekdays, you will see the stonemasons at their benches working. And what frankly stuns people is they're still working in the same way, with hammers, chisels, these very, very basic tools. Power tools are not involved. They're still using traditional methods, traditional crafts, the same stone, the same techniques. And so if we look over here, you better see the craft benches where they stand and they work and chip away and create these quite fantastical grotesques at times. You'll see the man here, looks quite normal. Pan down, you soon see anything but with a snake for a tail, toes for claws. Another over here, you'll see with his frog coming out of his mouth. And these are going to be, so these are going to be stuck out as, as gargoyles and grotesques, which you see, if we kind of pan up on the minster, you can see them sticking out there at kind of 45 degree angles to the main body of the church. Originally they worked as both two functions, to scare away demons, but also as water spouts, to bring water away from running down through the kind of foundations. But also within this, I'm just going to pound down so let's go past, we can see that there are ordinary pieces of wood. Um, oh really, Adam, fantastic. Um, glad to have you back. So ordinary uh, sort of sections, if you like, they're going to be replaced. So all this architecture here, sorry, the scaffolding, is all about, if you like, taking out the stone that needs to be replaced and keeping it all in tip-top condition for future generations. So we can say that whatever Jonathan Martin tried to do in 1829, he didn't succeed. We are still rebuilding, remaking, repairing, but that's who we are, that's what we do. And so I do hope you've enjoyed today's tour of the Minster Precinct. I very much enjoyed bringing it to you. With a lovely autumnal sunshine and a Apart from the odd flicker, a bit of buffering early on, hopefully, for the most part, you're able to enjoy that largely uninterrupted. So uh, thank you, everybody. If you're able to support this tour, that'd be fantastic. If you could subscribe to my YouTube channel, if you haven't already, that'd be great. That really kind of helps me. The more subscribers I get, the more people will see my videos. And in return, then, obviously, that'll then get more people come to the channel and so forth. So it helps everybody. 
to support the channel so if you could do that and uh, thank you everybody for your continued interest website is a uh, very nearby now so uh, hopefully we will be uh, in a really good solid place going into the autumn and when it starts to get darker lots of good tools so thank you from york and we say goodbye love to see you all and thank you <laughs>